Hey, welcome to those of you in all of our parishes, our parish online, our parish JC, our parish at Fifth and Park. I'm so excited you're here for week two of this kind of three-week mini-series about embracing change, about making solid convictions that should never change, and then allowing God to change the things in our lives that should change. Now, one of the things I want to continue to change is to continue to become a better communicator and figure out ways that I can interact better with, with the decisions that you're making. So if you have a smartphone or you have a tablet uh, in any of our parishes or you're online, I'm going to ask that you'd feel free to begin to interact with the teaching while I'm teaching. And ultimately my goal is to be able, we're working with our technology folks, ultimately my goal is to be able to, to interact with you while I'm teaching. And so, but we need you to start to interact. And so you can, you can send me a, a text, hey Dr. Cox, text hey Dr. Cox to 69302. Uh, you can tweet either hashtag or at hey Dr. Cox. And this would be great ways for me to begin to, to learn how to interact with you while I'm, while I'm teaching. So if you do that at any of our parishes, uh, that would be great for me and hopefully we'll add to, to our experience together. Now week two of this teaching series begins uh, with a question. And the question very simply is what do you want? What do you want? Now, I'm not asking this to you as a big, uh, deep uh, philosophical question or, or theological question. I'm asking this and says, what is it that you want? I, I would argue with you or submit to you that all of us at some point in this last week or some point this week will have something on our mind that this is what I want. Uh, this is what I want. So if you were to ask me, hey, Tim, what do you want? Here's my answer. I want this next Saturday, Saturday, May the 26th, to be a day without rain. It's our daughter's high school graduation. Her graduation party's after graduation. She wants it to be outside. And so I don't want there to be rain. Maybe better yet, I can say, I want my daughter to get what she wants. That's, that's what's on my mind. It's what's on my heart. It's, it's, it's what I want. Now, some of you would say, hey, what I want is something new. I want a new phone. I want a new bike. I want a new car. I want a new house. I want something new. Some of you say, I don't, don't care about anything new. I want something more. I want more work. I want more money. I want more children. I, I want something more. For some of you, it's not something new or something more. It's something less. <laughs> I want less work. I want less stress. I want less pain. For some of you, it's not new, more, or less. For some of you, it's just something else. Tim, this is what I've got, and I don't care what it is. I don't want this anymore. I want something else. Some of you are much more adamant than that, right? For some of you, it's, I just want. Have you ever just had a case of the just wants? I just want this to be over. I just want him to get his act together. I just want her to fill in the blank. There come those times when we, when we have a case of the just, what is it that you want today? And I'd like to talk with you about this because our, our approach to our wants really makes a difference. Have you, have you ever put all of your efforts, energies, and resources into getting exactly what you want only to be disappointed. Maybe you got it, and it didn't deliver for you that thing that you thought it was going to deliver. Peace, happiness, joy. Have you ever put all your efforts and in, energies into something and, and got just what you wanted? Or maybe you put all your efforts, energies, and resources into getting what you wanted, and you didn't get it. You came close, but you didn't get it. And when you didn't get it, how did you begin to feel? What were the immediate emotions when you came to the realization, oh, I didn't, oh, I was so close, but I didn't get exactly what I wanted. All of us will go through life either getting what we want and finding that it doesn't deliver or not getting what it wants and having to deal with those emotions. So what is it today that you want? I want to invite you to take your Bibles out and find Daniel, the third chapter. The book of Daniel, the third chapter, I want to show you the story of a king who desperately wants something. Daniel chapter 3, and if you're watching with us online and you don't have a Bible available to you, you can go to this website called Bible Gateway, just pull it up. It's a great place. I'm going to be reading from today's New International Version. You can find that. Uh, maybe you can just follow along. Whatever Bible you brought with you, Daniel chapter 3, uh, what do you really want? Here's a king who desperately wanted something, and he gets it. Almost. And from him and through his reactions, we can kind of understand a little bit more about how to deal with our wants. So what is it today that you want? Now here's our working agreement. We're going to read through Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to stop along the way, make some comments, ask some questions, get to a point where I'm going to ask you to make some personal applications, and then try to leave you with a little bit of a challenge from Daniel chapter 3. So Daniel chapter 3 starts this way. King Nebuchadnezzar, and we need to stop at that point. Who's King Nebuchadnezzar? King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. 
The city of Babylon is located in modern-day Iraq. It's uh, in, the, in the region of the Persian Gulf. And King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is making a march across the ancient world. And he is becoming the, the leader of the world's superpower. He marches in country after country and he defeats them and he destroys them. And in 605 BC he gets to what we would call the land of Israel. He moves into the city of Jerusalem and he captures the city of Jerusalem. And he even takes some of God's things out of the temple in Jerusalem, transports them back to Babylon and puts them in the temple of his gods. Now the working understanding is because Nebuchadnezzar defeated the people of Israel, that Nebuchadnezzar's gods are stronger than the God of Israel. We saw last week that that's just not the case. But this is King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He's making a march across the ancient world and he desperately wants something. Let's see what lengths he will go to to get what he wants. Now King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. It was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. I don't know what you need to do to grab a hold of 90 feet high. Maybe you need to think about a nine-story building. This thing is huge. This image is huge. Ninety feet high, nine feet wide, and he made it of gold. Now, was it pure gold? We don't know. At least let's agree that it's probably covered with gold. This thing was shiny. This thing was impressive. This was exactly what he wanted. Can you imagine how much it cost him to make a 90-foot image, nine feet wide, covered in gold? It took a lot of effort, because he, and he did it because he wanted something. And then it says he set it up in a specific place. He made this image and he set it up in a specific place. In the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And he was was saying, "This this is what I want. This helps me get what I want. Now what is it that he wants? Now I'm going to continue to read through this passage of scripture. And as you follow along, I need you, if you can please, to grab a hold of the cadence. I need you to grab a hold of the rhythm. I need you to grab a hold of the beat. I need you to come to see this passage in a different way. Because I believe this passage, Daniel chapter 3, is central to the story and the life of the people of Israel, and it's central to the story of those of us who choose to be followers of Jesus today. But we need to understand the the cadence and the rhythm. So here it goes. So he set up this, this image, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, covered in gold in a specific place, and then he summoned, verse 2, he summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. The storyteller doesn't write it once, he writes it twice of these people who are invited. So Nebuchadnezzar spends all kinds of money to build this thing. And then he goes to great efforts to invite the people that he wants to be there. The, the leaders, he, he invites them. And he invites them basically to a ribbon-cutting ceremony. And he says, come on in, there's going to be this ribbon cutting ceremony and I want something. I built this image 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, covered in gold. I want you to show up because I want something. And the writer tells us not once but twice who he invites. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, verse 4, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. Not only does he build an image 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, covered with gold, not only does he invite people to a ribbon cutting ceremony, but he says, when you get there, this is the command. By the way, if the king sends you a royal invitation to show up, it is not a mere suggestion. You show up. This isn't the kind of deal that says, hey, if you ever have the chance just to go to Babylon, and you get to the plain of Dura, It's worth your efforts to go out of the way just to see this image. Be kind of like us saying, hey, if if you ever travel out west, it's worth your effort or worth your energy probably to go a little bit out of your way to see Mount Rushmore. This thing that's been set up there. It's It's not that. It's you show up. You show up to this ribbon cutting ceremony and when you get there, you are commanded to do something. What are they commanded to do? And why does he do this? Because he wants something. Verse 5, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that the king, that king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Again, he doesn't say it once. He says it twice. He tells us with repetition, exact repetition, why. This king wants something. 
And the storyteller wants you to understand, if you still haven't caught the importance of cadence, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish, this one has a little star, this one has a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red and some are blue, some are old and some are new, some are sad and some are glad, and some are very, very bad. Why are they sad and glad and bad? I do not know. Go ask your dad. Who wrote it? Dr. Seuss. This was our daughter's favorite book when they were growing up. And I would submit to you that Dr. Seuss wrote more for the ear than he did for the eye. Dr. Seuss wrote to annoy parents. <laughs> because you read it once and your children say, Read it again, Daddy. And you read it again the second time and they say, Read it again, Daddy. And Dr. Seuss wrote for the ear and not for the eye. So your children, after hearing it two times, know if you skip parts. <laughs> Any other skippers in the room? We have a support group, so uh, it's not a big deal. <laughs> The storyteller writes for our ear. He wants to capture our attention. And that's why he says repeatedly, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, what are they supposed to do? Fall down and worship. If you don't fall down and worship this image, you get thrown into a blazing fire. The king wants something. And he goes to great efforts and energies to get it. He spends all kinds of money. He sends out all kinds of invitations. He makes all kinds of commands. And he says, here's the deal. When you hear the music, he got a band together. The band went through rehearsal. The band was prepared. And when the conductor of the band, you know, motioned for the band to begin, they begin to play. And the king wants a unanimous and a simultaneous response from all the people down on their faces worshiping. What the king wants to know is... Are there any pockets of rebellion built into my kingdom? Is there anybody that's unwilling to say that I'm really the God? Is there anybody still left that will not do what I tell them to do? And the king wants to condition the people that any time they hear this band and this music, they fall down and worship. What the king's saying is this. When you hear the music, fall down. Because if you remain standing, you'll face the music. And the music you will face is death. Death in a blazing furnace. Why? Because the king wants something. And the king gets what he wants. Almost. Verse 8. At this time, some Chaldeans who were astrologers came forward and denounced the, zoo, the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Now what I need you to hear at this point as we go through this text is this. They're kissing up to the king. That's all they're doing. And that's exactly what the king wants. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty, you have issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, sire, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. The king got what he wanted. Almost. What happens when you get what you want? Almost. Anger. Verse 13. Furious with rage. Ever happened to you? You put effort, energy, resources, time into getting what you want and you get it almost. And you get angry. And some bad things start to happen when you get angry. Furious with rage. Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? It should be a yes or no answer, right? You have two choices. Hear the music and worship the image or get thrown into the furnace. One of two choices and that's it. It should be a yes or no answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't get to answer. Verse 15. Now... When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. What's the king give Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? 
Second chance. Second chance. What was the king willing to do to get whatever it was he wanted? He was willing to compromise. He had already issued the command, hear the music and fall down and worship or thrown into the fiery furnace. And sometimes when you don't get exactly what it is you want, your temptation is to begin to compromise. What, what do I have to change? What do I have to adjust? I still have to go after this. I have to get what I want and I'm willing to compromise whatever it is I want to compromise. And the king begins to compromise. Then this next sentence, it's a question really, I think is the central question of this text. And it's really, I think, the central question of the scriptures as a whole. If you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Here's the question, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What God can rescue you? It's an insult. It's a reminder that, hey, my gods beat up your God. Your God is inferior to my gods. And you're going to stand up to me and not do what I tell you. You just need to know you're going down. So, here's another chance. But if you don't, watch out. Verse 16. By the way, before I go on. What God are you counting on to rescue you today? What God are you counting on to rescue you today? Whatever condition you're in, whatever situation you're in, whatever it is that you want that's really started to make you to compromise because you haven't got it exactly the way you wanted it, what, what God are you counting on to rescue you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King, uh, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If the God we serve is able to deliver us, then he will deliver us from the blazing furnace and from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Hey, king, you need to know something about us. We're living differently. And we hear your command, but we don't obey your command because we obey a different command. Hey, king, you need to understand something about us. The God we serve, we believe he's able to deliver us. But whether he does it or not, that doesn't matter. That, whether I get delivered like I want to be delivered or not, that's not the issue. King, here's the issue. We will not serve your gods or worship your image because we serve and worship another god. King, you need to know. We stand in your way of getting what you want and we're not going to budge. Why? Why? Because. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would simply say, King, our people are captive in Babylon for the very reason that we didn't listen to our God. This is what our God said. You'll have no other gods before me. That's what our God commanded. King, tucked into our law is the understanding, and we say it several times a day, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. King, there's one God. And we worship Him. And we are where we are in captivity because by the time you came and invaded Jerusalem in 605 B.C., by the time you raided our temple, our people had all kinds of gods. They refused to obey this very first and simple command, no other gods before me. And oh yeah, king, they also disobeyed the second command. Not to make an image that represented God. Don't make a golden calf and say, that's me, God would say. Don't form any kind of image and say, that's it, that's me. Hey, king, our people are in captivity because we have disobeyed. And by the way, our God is a jealous God. And so, king, we have a choice to make. And our choice is this. We will not go back there. We will not go back to living in disobedience to God. King, that's our choice. God can deliver us. He will or he won't. We don't care. What we do care is this. We won't go back there anymore. Application time. Where is it in your life right now where God says, don't you go back there ever again? There's some of you, four, five, six years ago, were living with a pattern, a behavior, a habit, a sin. And it was doing all kinds of damage to your life and to your relationships. And you met the eternal living God who said, I don't want you to live that way anymore. 
In my eyes, that is sin. And, and you came to the place where you realize, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And God has told you to live differently. And for the last three, four, five years, you've been living differently. But all of a sudden now, you hear some music that takes you back there. Something in your life has triggered that old pattern, that old habit, that old sin, that old behavior. And you're tempted to run right back there. And God says... Don't ever go back there again. It leads to trouble. There's some of you who would simply say, Hey, in the past, I doubted God. I doubted that He loved me. I doubted that He cared for me. I doubted that He had a, had a plan for my life. And, and Tim, I have, I have, there's something I want so bad, and I have concluded in my mind that this is exactly what God wanted for me. And it didn't come true. And now I'm tempted to go back there where I doubt and betray and live like there isn't a God who loves me. Don't go back there, my friends. You have to have a conviction in your heart that will never change. There's some of us, men and women, something tragic, something terrible, something horrific happened to you in your childhood. It should never have happened to you. And when it happened, you began to build some walls. You protected yourself and you made yourself numb to life's experience and numb to people because you didn't think anymore that you were lovely or lovable. And you couldn't trust anybody. And somewhere along the line, just a few years ago, you met Jesus Christ and he, he came into your life and he's begun to bring healing. And you've begun to open yourself and the walls have started to come down. And you've started to enjoy relationships the way God intends for them to be enjoyed. But somewhere something's triggered, some music is playing in your brain and it has triggered something that's taking you back there and the walls are starting to come back up and you're making yourself numb to love and numb to the experiences that God wants you to have. And God would simply say to you, don't go back there ever again. For some of you, maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's alcohol, drugs, sex, or maybe you have the most tolerable addiction in America, greed. And somewhere along the way, God has freed you from that addiction. But there's something playing in your head right now, and you want to run back there. Don't ever go back there again. Here's the deal. I'm not done with this teaching. But some of you are not going to be able to go with me any further through this teaching because this is the decision you need to make today. You've started to run so hard back there because God didn't give you exactly what you wanted the way you wanted it. And you're furious at Him. God, if you, would just, if you would just answer my prayer and this would be the answer to this court case, God, then I'd know you love me. And God didn't answer and didn't deliver for you in the court case and now you're running away from him all over again. I don't know. And some of you can't go any further until you make this conviction the reality of your heart. I will never go back there again. Would you pray with me? God, we just scratched the surface. But I believe you've spoken already deeply into hearts. And those that are hearing know where they want to run away from you. And they're willing to compromise convictions just to get what they want. So God, I pray for the one that's wrestling, that's heard some music that's had some kind of trigger that's gone off in their mind that's, that's leading them back to a pattern of behavior, a, a habit, a sin. And they want to go back there. God, I pray that right now they would stop. That they would surrender to you and simply say, God, I never want to go back there again. I'm tempted. I'm ready to compromise. I'm ready to start making bad decisions just to get what I want. So God, give them strength. 
give them courage to stand right now and say, I will never go back there again. May they make that decision today and tomorrow and every day after. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If that's you and you're wrestling with that, after our gatherings, if you're at one of our local parishes, the, the pastoral staff will be down front. They would love to talk with you and pray with you and help you and, and stand and help you stand with courage. And my friends, isn't it kind of this way that, that courage is often called for in some pretty weird places? Courage is called for in some pretty weird places. Courage is called for in the hallway at your school. Courage is called for at your locker. Courage is called for on your athletic field. Courage is called for in your cubicle. Courage is called for in your workplace. Courage is called for in your neighborhood. And you simply have to say, in courage, I will obey God. You see, most of the time, what happens is, is we want, when we obey God, for that to, to give us a, an easy roadmap to the next thing. But obedience never yields a roadmap. Obedience always yields courage to do the right thing. And so today you just need to obey and refuse to go back there. And some of you are saying, hey, Tim, uh, what, what about me? I blew it. Hey, Tim, my thing is anger. And Tim, I have thought for about the last four months that I was going to get the promotion at my workplace. And I've done everything I could to get that promotion. And in fact, I've already started to bank on the fact that I was going to get the promotion. And I've started to make some financial decisions and we planned a vacation based on the fact that I was going to get the promotion. And Friday at noon I was told I didn't get the promotion. And Tim, I went back there really fast. I chewed out the guy who got the job instead of me. I chewed out my boss. I chewed out my boss's boss. And I'm going to show up at work tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm not even sure if I got a job. I was such an idiot. Hey Tim, my temptation is anger and my, and my response is furious rage with my tongue. Hey Tim, I blew it. What do I do? What do you do when you blow it? What do you do when you run back there? And some of you may have run back there as recently as Friday. Some of you may have run back there as recently as last night. What do you do when you blow it? Let's keep going through the text. Verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times harder than usual, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and outer clo other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, and the furnace so hot, that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. You see what happens? when you're willing to go to whatever extremes it takes to get exactly what it is you want, you're willing to compromise, but then you start making really poor decisions. Who does it say that, Shadra, uh, that the king had tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What kind of soldiers? His strongest soldiers, which I would also interpret as probably his best soldiers. He was willing to compromise his best soldiers who are going to end up dying for the sake of an urgent desire. And some of you are willing to sacrifice your future just to get what you want now. And you're making some bad decisions. And your bad decisions hurt you and it hurts all those people around you. It's a bad decision to show, throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire because these guys were already told are ten times wiser and ten times smarter than anybody else that's running the king's business. He's willing to sacrifice the nation's future to get what he wants. He's willing to sacrifice his soldier's future to get what he wants. And I just wonder, was this the beginning of the end of the kingdom of Babylon? Because he's willing to sacrifice what's best for others to get what he wants. Have you ever found that happen to you that you don't get what you want, you compromise, and then you begin to harm those around you? Let me say this. Um, it says the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the fire killed the soldiers. I would submit to you when efforts to get what you want, there's not a blazing furnace that you're willing to toss people into, but there is something that you possess that causes a fire. The tongue is a small part of your body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by such a small spark. Your tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person and sets the whole course of one's life 
on fire. I would submit to you that when we begin to go after whatever it is we want, when we compromise, when we sacrifice others, it's our tongue that gets us into trouble. You begin to say things that you can't take back. And you begin to say things that kill and destroy those around you, whether it's your children or your co-workers. Be very, very careful. What is it you want? And to what extreme are you willing to go to get it? Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet. And he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Certainly, your majesty, they replied. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar was then approached, then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. And we make this story about the fiery furnace and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I think that's a misnomer. This isn't a story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. This is a story about an egotistical, monomaniacal king who wanted something so badly that he'd go to whatever efforts he had to to get it. And what he learns in the moment is that no matter how bad he wanted something, God wanted him more. He wanted a unanimous and a simultaneous response to a shiny, blazing image that people could worship. And what he got was the Almighty God to show up in a blazing fire and said, that's the God. And only that God's worthy of worship. My friend, no matter what you want, no matter how badly you want it, God wants you more. And God wanted Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And he went to great lengths to get it. So Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to rescue his servants. They trusted in him and defied, defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble as if the God who shows up in the fire unharmed needs somebody else to do anything on his behalf, right? You remember Nebuchadnezzar's question? If you say no to me, what God can rescue you? That was his question. Nebuchadnezzar now answers his question. Maybe the eight most powerful words in this text. For no other God can save this way. Hey, I asked you, who, who, who could rescue you from a blazing furnace? I understand now, no other God. You're God. No other God can save this way. Have you met that God? Have you trusted in the only God who's capable of rescuing you? And you blew it last Friday, and you're like, what am I supposed to do, Tim? I ran back there. Does God even want to have anything to do with me? And I would say, God wants you more than you want what you want. And he's willing to give you a second chance and a third chance. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. God's word says this, the wages of your sin demand death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God's word says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God offers you today salvation and there's no other God who can save like that. There's no other God who offers you a substitute sufferer who is willing to take your place and die a death on a cross and rise from the dead so that you could live. My friend, there's no other God who can save in this way. Do you know him? Have you surrendered your life to him and said, you can have authority over my life? God, I don't understand it all. And God, I am no longer willing to go after what it is that I want. God, I want you to come after me. Jesus was asked one time, hey teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We say it this way around here. What's God want from us? He wants us to love God, love people, and prove it. Those are the commands we need to live by. Love God, love people, prove it. Four things I want you to take with you. If you don't know Jesus today, if you've never surrendered to the God who is the only God who can save like this, that's the decision I need you to make today. Because you see, here's, here's the reality. The God I can shape into the form I want is not the God who can form me into the shape I need. And there's some of you, some of us, who have the tendency to, to, to shape our God into the form I want. Nebuchadnezzar wanted his God to look like 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, covered in gold. What is it you want your God to look like? 
God, I want you to be the one who, who makes this court case go away and who, who resolves this issue on my behalf. And God, if you don't do it that way, God, I'm going to shape you to be the, the answer to my prayers exactly the way I want my prayers to be answered. And you begin to shape your God. And the God I can shape into the form I want is not a God who can form me into the shape he wants me to be. Which is more important? That you have the ability to control your God and, and, and shape him into the form that you want? I don't think so. Maybe I can say it this way. The God that I can set up wherever I want him is not the God who can lead me wherever I need to go. Nebuchadnezzar set up this God where he wanted him. It says, in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar decided where he wanted his God to dwell. And we have the same tendency, don't we? God, I will set you up as God of my life from 11 to 12 on Sundays. But the other 167 hours of the week, no thank you. God, I will set you up as the God of my life over this trial because God, I need you to act in a certain way. And so God, I'll move you to be there, but I don't want you to be any place else. And my friends, the God you can set up wherever you want. It's not the God who can lead you wherever you need to go. Why do you think you can set him up where you want him and not in the other places of your life? It's something we all struggle with. And then maybe I could say it this way. The God that I can make as big as I want will always be too small to deliver what I need. Nebuchadnezzar Imagine this God, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, covered with gold. That was as big as he could imagine this God being. The God that I can make as big as I want will, never be, will always be too small to deliver what I need. Here's what God says. Your God can do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond everything you can think or imagine. And some of you have said, God, I just need you big enough to do this for me. And you're limiting his size over your life. And the God that you can make big enough to get what you want will always be too small to deliver what you really need. How big is your God today? What limits have you put on him? Where are you trying to set him? Where are you to try and decide he, he can have access and authority over your life and in these other areas he can't? What shape are you trying to create him in? And God says, you can't do that to me. I'm God. You're not. So, when it comes to what you want, one of two ways to approach life. The first thing is I'm going to approach life with me getting everything I want. I'm going to do whatever it has to take. I'll spend whatever efforts, energies, resources, money, time, whatever. I'll, I'll, everything for me to get everything I want. Or, and that's not how I'm going to approach this, I'm going to spend the rest of my life wanting God to get everything in me. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, what's your choice? Say, Tim, how's that, how's that play out in practical terms for me? There's absolutely nothing wrong with me telling God. In fact, God tells me to tell him what I want, thank him in advance for his answers. He said, hey, hey God, I want Saturday to be a day without rain. God, I want my daughter to get what she wants. And I think what God would speak into my heart, said, Tim, that's great. I know how much you love your daughter. And I know how much you want that day to be without rain. But Tim, is that really inside your control? Don't spend the next five and a half days worrying about that. How about instead, why don't for the next five and a half days, you focus on whether or not I have everything inside of you that I want. Why not for the next five and a half days, you continue to be on your knees for your daughter, not that she gets everything that she wants, but that I get everything that I want from her. How about that's a better use to spend your time, Tim? You see, there's a couple of different ways we can view life. Spending it, focusing on, on me getting everything I want or on God getting everything he wants from us. Which is your choice. Almighty God, in this moment, right now, we ask you to forgive us for only making you as big as we want you to be. We, we ask you to forgive us for setting you up only in those areas of our life where we want you to be present. And God, we ask you to forgive us 
for creating you in a form that we think is best for us. We acknowledge right now that you are God, and God alone there is no other. And God, we will no longer bow down to any other gods. We surrender to your authority over our life. Father, right now I, I pray for the one who's never said yes to the gift of Jesus that you offer. Father, you saw our need of forgiveness because of our sin and our sin deserves death and you sent Jesus to be our substitute sufferer. God, it's my prayer that the one who doesn't know Jesus yet would cry out, God, come into my life. Jesus, forgive my sins. Father, I pray for those of us that have prayed a prayer like that and have continued to, to just say it really doesn't matter. We'll, we'll make you however we want to make you. God, forgive us. And in these next days, God, whatever it is that we want, may we want you more. Because God, you want more of us. God, may we love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then may we go out and love a world that desperately needs to know that you love them too. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask whatever parish you're at, if you go ahead and stand up with me. Uh, we're going to end today's gathering like we've ended uh, last week, like we're going to end next week. There's going to be a scripture uh, on, the, on the screen. And we're going to read this together. And then I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing. If you've made a decision today, if there's anything we can talk with you about, the pastoral staff will be down front at our parishes. If you'd like to, to text us, you can text us again. You can email us. We would love to help you. Uh, if you've made a decision today, don't go out of here without telling somebody else about it. Would you read this passage of Scripture with me? Let's read together. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Almighty God, you have spoken with clarity into each of our lives. We have recognized what it is you want from us. And God, right now, before we take one step out of these places of worship, we say we will respond We'll say yes to Jesus. We'll say yes to your authority over our lives. God, whatever it is you've called us to, we'll, we'll, we'll say no to going back there. God, you've spoken. So may we obey. And in that obedience, may we find the courage to obey again an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now, a year from now. And now, my brothers and sisters, as you leave your place of worship, whether that's in a church building, a school building, or in your home as you're looking at a computer screen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. And until we meet again next week, may His favor and grace rest on you. Peace be with you. We'll see you next week.